So, um, thank you. And thanks for uh, doing Umse duty. Um, well, you, uh, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at, at the, uh, look at the view differently. All I see is myself. Um, you might wonder why I decided, why I asked to speak on uh, seven line prayer on Lama Tsongkhapa Day. <laughs> I, but I, 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 okay, the first part of the question is that I didn't know it was Tsongkhapa Day <laughs> when I did it. <laughs> so there, there's no, no intention there. But uh, of course, as Lama pointed out, there's no, there's also no conflict. So um, the second part though is probably the more to the point. Um, why, why did I want to talk about the seven line prayer? Well, it's not because I think you should know about the seven line prayer. It's not like that. For me, it's a, uh, well, I'll tell you how it happened. Um, in about 1993, I think it was, something like that, 92 maybe. Um, I had just uh, quit a career in magazine advertising sales because I didn't want to become the people that I saw it turned people into. I was becoming pretty successful and I realized that in order to continue along that path, I was going to have to become a two-dimensional man and I didn't want to be. So after uh, several years of, you know, like around the clock working, I, uh, stopped <laughs> and I was pretty well freaking out. Um, I uh, didn't know what I was gonna do. I didn't know where I was gonna go. I always, always read philosophy. I'm not gonna go into a whole bunch of crap there, but uh, I, I, was, I was a mess. I, I was intellectually uh, challenged in every way. I was trying to find a path to follow. I knew I needed, I knew I needed some kind of spiritual path. I didn't have one. All I'd been doing is working. And uh, I started doing Vedic chants, uh, and I found them deeply unsatisfying. And so uh, I, I had uh, earlier practiced in a sect of Japanese Buddhism, which uh, you might know as Nichiren, Nichiren uh, descended from uh, ultimately from the Tiantai school in China. Now, I, I don't have anything against Nichiren, and uh, in fact, Nichiren uh, saved my life in many ways, and I did a lot of Nichiren practice, but, but the uh, lineage wasn't for me. And so I thought, well, you know, this has really been a powerful thing for me. Maybe I should uh, look into the Tiantai sect and see if I can maybe find some texts in Tiantai and find people to practice with in the Tiantai. Tiantai people, they're, they're not really interested in having Westerners join their stuff. So I didn't really succeed at that. And I'm going, what's all this damn Tibetan Buddhist stuff everywhere suddenly, you know? So, cause it was right about the time Sylvia Rinpoche's book, uh, Tibetan book of living and dying came out. And there was a, a sudden flourishing really of, of texts that weren't really available much earlier than that. And so I bought Sylvia Rinpoche's book and uh, I had already read like the Bodhicharya, the Tar and some other things. It wasn't like I didn't know anything about Buddhism. But I bought Sylvia Rinpoche's book, and in there is uh, he talks a lot about Guru Rinpoche, and he talks a lot about uh, the Vajra Guru Mantra and the Seven Line Prayer. So, okay, I just started. I mean, at this is the time I was interviewing priests. You know, do I want to become a Christian? I don't think so. You know, do I want to become a Hindu? I was interviewing. I was going to ashram. I was talking to all kinds of people. So I started walking around and I'm freaking, I mean, I, I sit down to meditate and my mind is like an atomic bomb going off. There's no peace. It's just like a, or more, more like a, a gigantic rheostat gener or a generator, just, just throwing crap. I couldn't slow it down. Even though I sort of knew how, I still couldn't. And I started doing the Vajra Mantra, Om Ma Hum Vajra. Vajra, of course, I did not pronounce it like a Tibetan. Oma Hung Vajra Guru Padma Sidi Hung. And uh, uh, over and over and over while I'm walking around, I go out for long walks, I keep saying it and saying it and saying it. And then I ran into the seven line, uh, seven line prayer. I started, 
you know, just keep over and over and over and over and over and over. And you know what? I would stop and my mind was clear. So I'm like, okay, this seems to work. Now, how do I find... It's, it's impossible. I will never, all of the texts say you need to have a llama. This is not possible. I will never, how would I ever meet these guys? Remember, there was no internet, first of all. How would I ever meet these guys? Where, where would I ever find these guys? You know, I, I knew who Chogin Trungpa was, but, but I, and I went to one of his centers once and I was like, nope, not doing this. So um, in New York City. So I'm like, I, I don't know how this can happen. Okay, so I, I fly to I fly to San Francisco. Uh, uh, then uh, I, I I buy the Bodhicharya of the Tar in this two volume set that has oh, it's fantastic. I read it on the airplane on the way back to New York City. My second reading of it, but this time it, I was like, yes, this is definitely the thing. This is what I'm going to do. There's no question about it. I get to New York City. I see a flyer. Uh. Myosho Kempo Rinpoche bestowing the, the, the Guru Rinpoche uh, empowerment. I had no idea, I had no idea what it was, but I go, wow, Tibetan Lama, right? So I show up at this thing with a pillow from my bed to sit on, because they said to bring something to sit on. And uh, of course, I had no idea. I didn't know anybody. I didn't no idea what was going on. Walk in. And uh, I'm laughing at them because they're pronouncing uh, Om Ah Hung Vajra Guru Padma Siddhi Hung as Om Ah Hung Pema, Om Ah Hung Menzu Guru Pema Siddhi Hung. It took me a while to figure out what they were saying. And, and uh, I had this impacted tooth. The tooth just suddenly was okay. Like after I started laughing at them doing the mantra and my tooth suddenly healed. Uh, Nyosho Kempo, I can still think of Nyosho Kempo sitting there. And I'll immediately just chill out. We were we were sitting uh, hardly enough room space for me to sit. I, I didn't tell you the part where I went in. I looked around, I left and started crying and left and stood outside and watched all the people coming in with their little bags and their zafus and stuff and they're, they're all nicely dressed and I'm like this, in, you know, I'm just just a just like hobo showing up kind of with a pillow from his bed. <laughs> And finally, I decided to go in, and I, I braved it and went in and sat down. And uh, through that, I read, met Chagad Rinpoche, you know, uh, met uh, Kempo Gurme Trinley Rinpoche, you know, and met Lama Jinpa Rinpoche. So, so that's why I want to talk about the seven. Um, and also the fact that it's uh, Lama Tsongkhapa Day. Oh, what was I just thinking? You <laughs> know, in, in a way, in a way, it's it's good because uh, uh, all of the all of the Tibetan schools come from this time when Buddhism was established in Tibet. And uh, Jada Rinpoche, that's why, that's what I was thinking. Jada Rinpoche, right before he came to Sacramento last November, mm-hmm. or the November before this last month, when he uh, came to San- Sacramento to uh, give the empowerment uh, for uh, Kala Chakra, the, like the week before I hear, he was uh, giving the uh, uh, Guru Rinpoche empowerment. So we, we have, we, we, we don't, it's not a separate thing, but it's true that I mostly come from the Nyingma school when I'm speaking of this. And my guide for this text is uh, Jamgong Mipam, who is uh, really the man who in the uh, latter, latter part of the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century, uh, put the Nyingma school on a firm philosophical basis. So I'm gonna share my screen. Oh, so you don't have to look at me the whole time. Oh, but I, one second, sorry. What I had done, I thought maybe I was going to wind up doing this talk. So now I've lost my talk. I mean, the uh, umze, so now I lost my talk. <laughs> oh, come on. Really?
So how was your weekend? <laughs> um, um, slide, harm, Padre Yuda for Sunday. I've got so many things is the problem. Uh, there it is. All right, so I won't be able to see you while I'm doing this because I want to share my screen full screen and uh, so that it's easier to see. Uh, so as I said, it's based on, well, let's see, try to gain control. I'm really anxious about this talk for some reason. I'm not usually. Um, so White Lotus is a book by Jemgon Mipam. It's an explanation of the seven line prayer. And it's available uh, both in, uh, well, it's, it's available in like in in Kindle in uh, in the other form, which I can't think of right now, EPUB form, and uh, it's also there's an audio book of it, so it's pretty easy to find. Plus paperback and hardcover. And this is the translation uh, that you've seen. Now I should also tell you about this picture. Uh, most people who have practiced with me at the lunar practice already know this, but this uh, particular picture is a, a photograph that was taken of the of the statue in Lhasa in uh, I think it was 1939. And as you notice, it's in color and it wasn't originally. But this stat this was a statue in Lhasa called the Looks Like Me statue. It, the statue was made in the eighth century of Guru Rinpoche, and they um, they showed it to him, and he said, "Looks like me." So they call it the Looks Like Me statue. Uh, after uh, the uh, Chinese invasion of Tibet, the, uh, a lot of lamas got together and they, they pulled their memory on, on the colors and everything of the statue and someone colorized it. So this is a colorized version of the picture taken uh, in the 30s. So let's do the prayer one more time here. And I'm doing it, oh God, who knows what style this is. Just going to play. I hope this works. I'm going to play uh, Chagdid Rinpoche doing the seven line prayer. First teacher. Jack the Rinpoche say would he would he would do that he'd be he'd be talking uh, uh giving a teaching on something and he would just go he would just stop and go or you know do you know John the name I guess I don't believe in the dog you know do name him as a nation is a drug good and then I'm a boy he is a dog you can do those is a good of them I see the home just keep on talking as though nothing else to uh, intervene so now this is a translation uh actually the one in the book is different from this and I'm not putting the one in the book down but this one is probably a little bit more uh, easy, easier, a little easier to see what's going on. So Hun, on the northwest border of the country of origin, in the pollen heart of a lotus, you attained marvelous, most excellent CD. 
renowned as the lotus born, who are surrounded by a circle of many dakinis. As I practice following in your footsteps, I pray that you approach to confer your blessing. Guru Pema Sidi Hong. All right, so here from Mipam is the value of this prayer, and I'm, I'm going to just read this because this is a quotation from him, and I thought it would be easier if you can see it. Of all the prayers of the great and glorious masters of Odiana, embodiment of all Buddha's past, present, and to come, the invocation composed to seven Vajra verses is supreme. It arose spontaneously as the natural resonance of indestructible ultimate reality and is an immense treasure mine of blessings and accomplishments. Now, I, I agree with this statement, which is why I showed it to you. <laughs> so uh, what is the prayer? Where did it come from? According to Mipam, it, it arose, uh, here we go, it arose spontaneously as the natural resonance of indestructible ultimate reality. That's where it comes from. And uh, it's the invocation used by the Dakinis to invite Guru Rinpoche to their Gana chakras or in Tibetan at Sok, or in our case, uh, say ritual feast, you could call it, but that sure seems to make it sound boring. Um, <clears throat> so the Dakinis, if they needed Guru Rinpoche there, they would call him using this prayer. Uh, and there was a time in legend uh, that, you know, way before. Tibetans invited Guru Rinpoche to Tibet back in the early days of Nalanda Monastery. Uh, that 500 uh, non Buddhist pundits, experts in grammar and logic, they, they showed up and they challenged, Guru, challenged these monks at Nalanda to, uh, Nalanda to uh, uh, a debate. And of course, at, at the end of the end, a, a display of power. And of course, at the end, whoever won, everybody else had to convert. So the Buddhist monks are like, wow, we can't compete with these guys. We, we don't know how to argue with these guys. These guys are like what really heavy duty uh, uh, debaters and we, we don't know what to do. So this Takini, she shows up and she says, well, my brother will help you. And they go, well, where is he? And she says, well, he's in Odion, which is uh, for, in terms of geography, that's Northwest Pakistan. And they said, well, we don't have time to get there and it's too hard to get there. We can get him get him here in time to finish this debate and she said go up on the roof prepare a feast and sing this prayer and she gives them the seven line prayer so of course they won the debate because Guru Rinpoche came because Guru Rinpoche has said that if he comes if you I mean no if he Guru Rinpoche has said if you with sincerity you know, see, I don't like to, I personally, the word devotion, they keep translating devotion, but devotion is so, rings so funny in English. Um, I, I think it's more like uh, this uh, sincerity, uh, deep uh, uh, confidence combined with sincerity or a, a desperation might work too. <laughs> Which it did for me when I was in a desperate mood. Uh, that if you if you pray to him with this prayer with sincerity or with devotion that you he will come immediately. Uh, in later times, of course, he gave this prayer around eight hundred uh, eight hundred the common era. He gave the prayer to King Dirisong Detson and everyone else in Tibet who uh, had the karma to receive it. And he also, uh, because I don't know if you're familiar, but Guru Rinpoche hid uh, Padmasambhava. This is what he's most widely known. I should actually say something about that. Padmasambhava was uh, the name that the first people who encountered Guru Rinpoche in Tibet, the first Europeans, that was the first word, name they learned for, for him. So that's the one that we use as the main one. But the Tibetans tended to call him either Guru Rinpoche or actually Padmakara, which means the same thing, uh, lotus born, but it's it's what they they call him Padmakara usually rather than Padmasambhava. Although you hear the Tibetan lamas here will call him Padmasambhava because they know that then you know what they're talking about. So, so they just call him that too. But anyway, he uh, hid treasures all over, practices all over Tibet uh, for later generations, and all of those included this prayer. And so now I'm actually going to talk about the prayer itself. Um, Mipam discusses the prayer on three levels, which are really four. 
because almost everything that's three is almost always four in the end, isn't it? There's the outward literal sense of the prayer, and that's the talk today will be on the outward literal sense, but it's still a profound sense. There's the inner hidden meaning of the Vajra words, and there are two levels of that from the uh, two, two, two of the tantric levels, basically, uh, Dzogchen being the higher of the two. And then how this prayer is implemented and implemented on the path, how it's used uh, to further the path. And I will keep referring back to this, but I'm giving each line at a time. Kum organ yuji nu chang sam. Kum. And it's interesting, we use H U N G, and that's not a bad transliteration really for the Sanskrit hum. That's the only word in this line, though, that's in Sanskrit. The rest of it's Tibetan. So, uh, according to Mipam, it's uh, hum is the self arisen seed syllable of the mind of all the Buddhas. And that's not just Mipam, that's pretty much standard view of, of the syllable hum. That's what the hum, hum represents. Uh, the north, oh, I have an error in the formatting. Northwest border of Odion. Uh, is the land of the Dakinis, it's at the frontier. So if you think though, if you take it out of this, I, I don't, I'm not gonna do a materialist historical thing here. I'm, I'm, I'm talking uh, from, from, from the view of the tradition. Um, this, this border, this Northwest border is the, the, the border between Samsara and, and Nirvana. It's the, it's this right on the, edge of the awareness of, of the of the of existence and that's the land of the dakinis that's where they're they're the dakinis the dakinis are active there um and what you find there is this uh, gigantic pure lake called Danakosha. it's uh endowed with all of the eight great qualities of water which i cannot enumerate off the top of my head and i didn't list them so uh, the eight great qualities of water. Uh, it's very deep. It's covered in lotuses. And it has a gigantic lotus in the center of it. And on this gigantic lotus, uh, now we get to Pema Gesar Dongpola in the pollen heart of the lotus. In this gigantic lotus, which is an ancient symbol of uh, perfection. I mean, that's, uh, if you read like, uh, the Bhagavad Gita, you know, the, the, the lotus face. So we're talking about an old, old symbol of perfection, the lotus. And in the center, a very perfect, really large lotus in the center. And uh, they say that the, if you look at the, if you look at the way the lo a lotus is formed, if it were large enough, it would make a comfortable seat to sit on, almost like a throne in the center of it. Uh, and there are five lotuses growing from this stem. Actually, it's four other ones, the, the fifth one in the center, four other ones. Uh, and each of those is the five Buddha families. And this arrangement of the Buddha families, uh, because uh, Guru Rinpoche, uh, Padmasambhava is from, is, a, is in the lotus family. He's an emanation of Amitabha. So the center, of this uh, organization of, of uh, the Buddha families is the Lotus family. Uh, and so there's this uh, Lotus there in big Lotus in the center of the lake and Amitabha generates Hri, which is also another, is the distillation of all the blessings of all the Buddhas. He generates this Hri syllable and projects it into the center Lotus flower there. Uh, and it's Yatsen uh, Chogi No you attain marvelous, most excellent Siddhi. The Hri shines with the five colors of the Buddha families. It's like a rainbow light shining down, and it descends to the pistol, uh, pistol cup of the lotus, and it transforms into Guru Rinpoche, uh, fully formed and manifested in an enlightened state. And from that state, at that time, he was he manifests as a, as a as a small child. 
and King Indrabuti came looking for the, a treasure island and saw him and said, this must be some kind of divine child sitting in a lotus in the middle of this gigantic ocean and picks him up and takes him home and makes him king, makes him a prince. He's the heir to the, to the he, he's the, I forget what it's called. Anyway, he's the heir to the kingdom. The Guru Rinpoche is like, I, I can't, I can't do this. I need, so he, he, he does some things to get out of it. I'm not going to get into those stories right now. I could, I could go on all day about Guru Rinpoche. So he leaves and he practices in the eight charnel grounds. So he's demonstrating, he's, he's, he was already enlightened as a, as a, as a, as a, at the moment of his birth in this lotus, but he uh, has, he went through all of the stages of the path and trained in all of the stages in the path. Pema Jungne, see Jungne, Pema Padmakara, Pema Jungne Jesu Drak, Pema Jungne, Padma born, I mean lotus born. Pema, Padma, renowned as the lotus born. Having achieved supreme mastery, he became known as the lotus born. <laughs> Padmasambhava, Padmakara, the supreme Vidyadara. And by the way, in Sanskrit, Vidyadara is a very old word that meant like sorcerer, magician. That's not what we, that's not what it means in Tantric Buddhism, but it's, it's interesting to notice that that's where the word comes from. Um, of course, he uh, is always, always surrounded by an infinite number of dakas and dakinis. Dakas are just the male forms of the dakinis. Now, I was going to show a different picture here, but I chickened out. It was a really radical dakini picture, <laughs> but I was afraid that some people might be offended since this is a public talk, so I, didn't, I decided not to use it. But here you can see, by the way, all of these pictures are from uh, HimalayanArt.org. And I uh, really suggest that you, you go there. They, they, they have, it's not just Guru Rinpoche, they have, every, they have just a huge body of uh, Buddhist works of art. And uh, they also have a YouTube channel, which is very good, where they talk about the various works of art. So he's surrounded by a circle of many dakinis. Oh, what does that mean? Yeah. Okay, so he's got these, pe these people, these beings dancing around him. But what they are is the act, they're the enlightened activity of all of the Buddhas. And they're inseparable from Guru Rinpoche. There's not, it's not like there are, there's Guru Rinpoche and there are the dakini. And it's not like there are Guru Rinpoche and the dakinis. You could say that there are Guru Rinpoche and the three roots. Uh, and that might be a term that you're not familiar with, but the three roots is Lama Yidam Khandro. That's a, it's a Tibetan formulation, which is a, a Guru Yidam and, and uh, Dakini. So uh, the Yidam, when you practice, say, Kala Chakra, for instance, Kala Chakra is, your, is the Yidam deity of your practice. So Lama Yidam Khandro and also protectors, like in, in the Gelug sect, Paul the Lama, primary protector. So there's no separation here. Kordu Kondro Mung Po Kor is just expressing this, this, uh, this, this uh, more extensive presence of Guru Rinpoche. Yet Jesu Dagdru Ki, as I practice following in your footsteps. And of course, that's you know what's anytime we practice any type of Tibetan Buddhism at any level, we're really following in Guru Rinpoche's footsteps. Uh, we might go off, we might walk off, wander off sometimes if we're X, Y, or Z, but once you're on this path, it's pretty hard to leave. I've tried <laughs> not easy to leave. <clears throat> and when we use the seven line prayer as uh, as practice, as our method of practice, we're explicitly following in his footsteps. This picture, by the way, is the Copper Color Mountain. That's the pure land of Guru Rinpoche, where he resides now. And it's in the realm of the, it's in, the, it's in a land of rakshasas, of, 
uh, cannibal. They, well, they're often translated as cannibals, but basically they just eat everything. And I guess a rakshasa is not a person, so when they eat a person, they're not really a cannibal. <laughs> they're just a man eater <clears throat> or a woman eater. So, Jinji Lobchir Sheg Su Saw, I pray that you approach to confer your blessing. And so we pray with at this point with complete trust and when we have expelled all of our doubts and confidently suffocate him with yearning and sincerity, his blessings will saturate us. So that then leads to the mantra, Guru Pema Sidi Hum. And of course, that's the uh, center of the mantra. We have Oma Hum Vajra added to it when we do the mantra recitation by itself outside of the prayer. And usually when we practice this, uh, we do, you know, we, we say the seven line prayer three or seven, 21, 108 times. It's always almost never in, in, if you're really practicing it, do you just say it once? And usually uh, always three, seven or 21 or 108. And so what is the uh, guru is the Lama. Uh, heavy with good qualities, unsurpassed is uh, closer to Lama. Guru is heavy, more like heavy with qualities. Uh, Padma, uh, of course, is Lotus and that's part of his name. Siddhi refers to the supreme accomplishment in old, older, uh, in, in classical Sanskrit, Siddhi just really means success, accomplishment, success. Uh, refers to the supreme accomplishment, the enli enlightenment, plus all of the lesser powers, you know, lesser powers like being able to fly through the sky or whatever. There's, some people can develop those or walk through walls or mummify yourself, but you know, th those aren't the powers we're seeking. So if they happen to happen, that's fine, but it's not what we're after. With whom, and it probably won't happen with most of us, <clears throat> and with whom we invoke the precious master imploring him to anoint us. I'm using the word anoint. Robert Thurman used it and really, uh, oh, geez, now I'm, uh, I'm forgetting my, I lost track of words now. Well, the, the, the Sanskrit word that we use for empowerment, now, unfortunately, I just, I can't remember right now. Uh, really kind of means anoint. Uh, so it's like the anointing a king or a queen, or a, or a, or a, queen, a ruler. Uh, it's it's in giving power. What it's doing is recognizing the condition of power, formalizing the condition. <clears throat> so I'll uh, sum up. Um, Line one reveals his Guru Rinpoche's birth. Line two reveals the manner of his birth. Line three, his extraordinary greatness. Line four reveals his name. Line five remem reminds us of, of his vast retinue, meaning his vast uh, potential. And line six shows us how to pray. In line seven, along with a mantra, shows that our mind is blessed and that we will gain accomplishment. But I'm not going to let you off the hook yet because I still have enough time to impose on you a little bit more. And this was this was the uh, optional part of the talk. I was wasn't sure if I was going to get to it or not. Is this too much already? Okay. Because if you want me to stop, I'll stop. Um, this this is a oh, method of practice. Going. I'm sorry. Just thank you. Keep going. Everybody's very excited. Oh, okay. Okay. To me, it just sounds like I'm rambling. So uh, uh, you've you've heard of if you've done any tantric practice, you've heard of the uh, generation stage or the uh, creation stage. I I, I think Lama does, Lama Jinpa does, and I do uh, prefer to call it the creation stage, but it's not widely called generation stage. So, so the beginning, when, no matter what practice it is, whether it's Kala Chakra or, uh, or Tara or uh, 
Vajrasattva, whatever, whatever practice. Uh, the beginning of it, when you, when you, when you, or Medicine Buddha, when you, when you visualize, you're at the beginning of the generation stage or the or the creation stage, and that's the. You you usually only hear uh, generation and completion, but both generation and completion are are, sep are broken into four in two stages each. So there are really four stages, and they could of course be broken down even farther. But uh, the first stage is the approach phase, and that's when you you sit down and you 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 start visualizing before you start reading, usually if you're following the way it's usually done, but maybe it's after you started reading. Whenever it is, that's the, that's the approach phase. And in this case, we visualize Guru Rinpoche in the sky in front, seated on a lotus flower on the Donakosha Lake, accompanied by, you know, surrounded by uh, Yidams, Dakinis, and Lamas. And the close approach is when we begin to actually pray while visualizing. And so these are quotations from Mipam, the ultimate mode of being the ground, wherein both we and Guru Rinpoche are primordially inseparable. That's what we're doing in this close approach phase. Namely, the self-arisen primordial wisdom, which is subject to no movement of discursive thought. And so that is referred to as the guru. So in this situation, you know, we're, we're visualizing. Uh, while we're visualizing, our mind should be consumed with this activity that we're engaged in, the activity of visualizing and chanting the mantra. And while we're while we're completely enveloped in this situation, our mind and now now we are actually uh, in 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 no different from the Lama, and that is the guru. That that situation is the guru here, in a way. I'm not, don't don't take me too literally, but that that is the guru. That is what we're that that's the. That's what we're always talking about to begin with, right there. And because deluded perceptions are themselves primordially pure, because these perceptions that we regard as, as disturbed all of the time, that disturb us, <laughs> are primordially pure. And because of that, the path is free from all striving. So now, you know, once you're enveloped in this deep concentration of, of, of and focus of of the visualization combined with the mantra, you're free from strive. Now you're free from striving. You're you're relaxed. The fruit is spontaneously present, like a lotus in, in full flower. It's just there. And so here, it's the path is referred to now as the lotus. So that all by itself, if that's all you do, you have already you know stepped into a different realm of of experience but there's always another stage which i see people usually missing and that that's the completion stage often sometimes called the perfection stage but i don't like it. i don't like to call zoshin great perfection i call it great completion so there you go i don't i don't like that word perfection personally uh so the accomplished now the this this completion phase uh is also in two parts. And so once you've recited the, the prayer and then the mantra and you've got the visualization going, you're you're totally in, in you're totally completely enveloped and engaged in this. Your your entire reality is this. The 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 room you're in or the garden you're in or wherever it is that you are is 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 a tantric palace you're you're not you're you're no longer you know just walking around uh, with a quotidian world and so once you're once you're here here uh and you've recited the prayer as often as you've set out to recite it because before you start practicing you say i'm going to do ten thousand mantras or 
a thousand mantras or whatever it is. At that moment, at that time, when you stop, all of the all of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and all of the entourage, in this case Guru Rinpoche, they all they all in the the entire universe actually turns into light and melts into his heart, dissolves into his retinue in his heart, and then they melt into light and dissolve into us. So that's the accomplishment phase. And now we have the recognition, there's no, there's, there should, there's no discursive thinking, but there's this recognition of the unity of ourselves and the Lama, that we're, we're the same, that we're one. And here we rest. And that's when they say rest in unfabricated ease. This is where we rest in unfabricated ease. Our minds inseparable from the awareness of the Lama and we behold the Dharmakaya in person and we just rest there. So that's the, gener that's the creation and completion of uh, Vajrayana uh, practice from my point of view in a nutshell. That's, so, you know, you, you talk to a Ruth Lama um also here i used to uh okay when, when i visualize guru rinpoche while i'm practicing uh it used to be simple for me he was just chagdad rinpoche and then chagdad rinpoche died and kempo gyurme trinley rinpoche became my teacher and i didn't want to replace Chagdad Rinpoche, but I also didn't want to dismiss my current teacher. So now, to me, Guru Rinpoche was both of them simultaneously. And then I met Lama Jinpa, <laughs> and uh, Kempo Gurme died, and I met Lama Jinpa, and now uh, I had the same situation with Lama Jinpa that, that I had with Kempo Gurme. And so to me, Guru Rinpoche is all three of them simultaneously. And of course, they are not really separate anyway. They're just different expressions of the same thing. And so here, to conclude, picture Jada Rinpoche of Jinpa Rinpoche. In the ultimate expanse, which is self-arisen and spontaneously present, the primordial wisdom of self-awareness is clearly and already manifest. This is referred to as siddhi, or accomplishment. And although in terms of conceptual distinction, the self-arisen primordial wisdom may be classified as ground, path, and fruit, these three are not different in nature. Ground path and fruit. I love that. Chagdi Rinpoche used to, they would translate for him, interpret for him, and they'd say, ground path and fruition. And he'd, he'd interrupt and go, no, fruit, fruit, fruition, your word, fruit, fruit. Anyway, so ground path and fruit. Uh, and these three are not different. Ground path and fruit are not different from one another. This is directly perceived by self cognizing awareness. And it's indicated by the syllable home we finish with our completion. So if you would be willing to do this with me, I would like to take about seven more minutes of your time all together, sing the mantra, sing the prayer once, do a hundred Vajra Guru mantras. Uh, I will do them, a hundred of them silently, or I'll start them, I'll sing the first three of them. And then we'll sit for six minutes, if that's okay. Actually, I'm not asking permission, that's what we'll do. <laughs> And let me get the prayer back up. Cool again, Yugi Nujang Sam, Pe Magi Zardong Pula, Yatsen Chogi Nujang. Pay manjune 
Om Mahum Benza Guru Pema Siddhi Om
Okay. Well, I'd like to dedicate this talk to anyone here who has challenges of any sort, and especially to uh, today to Ellen, because she just had knee surgery. But if I were aware of something else, it might include you. And to all beings uh, throughout in time and space. And now, uh, if uh, you have any questions or comments, please. Thank you, Dirk. My screen. Dirk, this is Patty. And um, I just wanted to thank you for deepening my understanding. And I'm going to carry some of the things I've learned to my practice. So thank you so much, Dirk. You're welcome. You can always just read White Lotus, it'll give you even more detail. Hey, Dirk, this is Susan. Just um, reiterating what Patty just said. Thanks a lot. That was that was really a terrific um, understanding of, of the outer explanation of the of the the seven line prayer and the um, explanation of, of uh, the two stages was also really helpful, I think. Thank you. Um, just as a sideline, um, are you planning on doing um, King of Prayers on the first? On New Year's uh, yeah. Day? Yeah. Would you say a little something about that before we close? Uh, sure. You don't have to do it right now, but I mean, if other people have questions. Okay. I just, and if you know, I forget, would you, would you re remind people to make me remember? <laughs> Because you never know, somebody could ask me a question and then I'll forget everything else. <laughs> yeah, because I, I don't think a lot of people here may have done that with us before on New Year's Day. So maybe just. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for reminding me. Dirk, it's Ellen. I had a question. I have actually have two questions. <clears throat> the first question that occurred to me was I was wondering whether you first learned the prayer and recited it. You know, you're explaining how it sort of just f fixed your tooth issue and things like that? Or did you study about the prayer and then start, you know, like, did you first learn the prayer and recite it and later studied it? Or did you study about it before you ever started reciting it? Well, the first thing I did was read Sogya Rinpoche's book, The Tibetan Living of, Book of Living and Dying. And there really, it wasn't the prayer so much as the mantra. Mm -hmm. So uh, then I then I looked then I went for the prayer, and the tooth thing was really during the Guru Rinpoche empowerment. So I, I, it's all bound up together, kind of. I mean, I didn't really know anything, but I did read a little bit before I started using it. But the main thing was the application, and having like feeling that might this might actually be something that had value for me to do while I was doing it. Of course, if you don't think it has any value, it, it probably wouldn't have. Like if I if I thought, oh yeah, here's another thing, I'll just keep saying it over and over while I think about uh, whether or not I can get a job next week, and then you probably wouldn't have worked. But, but so it was more about, I think that I was desperate enough that, or I don't know, maybe I just, you know, the Christians talk about grace. Maybe I just had that that type of grace at the, at that time where I just had a, was just able to see it uh, for what it was you know, with, without, uh, without thinking about it too much, without analyzing it, which isn't like me. So something happened. Thanks. The other question I had um, just to clarify is, do you use the seven line prayer itself as sort of your practice of the generation and completion stage? Just that, I, that sort of self-contained seven lines? I, I have, uh, I, I, that's not my daily practice though. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, but, I, but I always, uh, that, that seven line prayer is always there for me. It's always in my mind. I could, I, there's, there's, it's never, it's never far from me. But I don't really practice it formally that way. I, I have in the past, but I, I, I haven't been. 
Well, I guess maybe let me restate my question. You're, you're, I think you were suggesting that it in itself is a complete practice of that. Nature. It is, yeah, uh -huh. it is. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool, I think. Yeah, it's one of the most, it's, you know, it's, it's extremely concise and contains the entire path. Easy. So if you, if you need a quick fix, nothing better. My knee feels better already. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> That's like I do the Tursar Nundra, Tursa, Dujum Tursar Nundra, which was given to me by Chagdid Rinpoche. Uh, and uh, it's, it's you know, like when I told Lama that's one, he goes, that's a really short one, right? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it's really short. But you can you you can make it really long if you want to. Same with the, the seven line prayer, because you can say the prayer 108 times and then do the mantra 10,000 times. And now you've had a long session, right? And it's the same. Same is true with the uh, uh, the Jim to Jim Tursar Nundro. It's uh, you can do it really fast, but you can also uh, practice it as the whole path. Really excellent talk. I agree. Thank you. Thank you. I've been lucky. If if you had the teachers that I've had, you'd already be enlightened. Unfortunately, I'm not. <laughs> but but I've had a lot of I've had a lot of great opportunity. <laughs> that's for sure. You want the quick fix? Oh, my, uh, I can give you my slides, sure. They're not really slides, they're, uh, let me see. I can probably just put that up right now if I find it in my, well, maybe I shouldn't, I'm not gonna take the take up your time I'm trying to figure out how to share it out of my Google Drive, but it's just a PDF. Yeah, I'm glad to have, send it. Although, you know, I cut out a lot of explanation. The better than my slides uh, is The White Lotus by Jangon Mipang. Because Mipang is really the one, Mipang is the one who put that explanation together. I abstracted it from Mipang, but uh, Mipang, the clarity is all Mipangs. Dirk, it doesn't look like we have any further questions, but we'd love to hear about New Year's. Oh, okay. Uh, well, and as long as I'm gonna talk about New Year, I wanna talk about one more thing, which is that it would be really great if everybody would subscribe to the Lion's Roar YouTube channel. You don't have to watch the videos if you don't want to, but please at least subscribe to it. And then the other part of that is, if you would like all of the videos that, not this video when it gets up there, but all of the videos that Lama, of Lama, if you'd get, do the thumbs up thing on them, it really makes a difference. It'll give us more tools if we have more subscribers. It'll give us more reach. More people are gonna see uh, Lama's videos. Uh, it's, it's really important to do that. So, and, and this is my failing. I, I, I've known it all along and I've never brought it up before. So I just, the other day I went, wait a minute, everybody should be liking all these videos, just aside from any. Oh, <laughs> see.